Good evening, everyone. It's great to be here. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth, Frank, and Steve, and Pam. Uh, and I also want to uh, especially thank uh, the student group of organizers who, uh, I guess for the first time, got behind the Grunig Lecture and did a fabulous job. I mean, there is all kinds of buzz out there. I'm hearing from old friends I haven't heard from in years, and people I owe money to, so <laughs> the word is really getting out. Um, as I think back on the dozens and dozens of speeches that I've given over the last 30 years uh, at Fleischmann Hillard, I was really reflecting on this, and tonight, and this speech may prove to be the most important ever uh, that I've delivered. I want to encourage you to tweet and video and photo and post your hearts out if you want. Let's get the word out and um, let's get this thing trendy. Um, it is an honor to be asked to speak at this prestigious university you know, surrounded by the great legacy of the Grunigs. First, uh, just permit me to salute Drs. James and Larissa Grunig for a lifetime of contributions to the study and advancement of public relations. In particular, uh, identifying the four models of public relations that many of us uh, debate even today. Press agentry, public information, two-way symmetrical communications, and one-way asymmetrical communications. Now, I don't pretend to lecture this expert Grunig audience on the differences, except to note two things. First, symmetrical communications put, puts ethics at the heart of the process. Whereas asymmetrical communications, that is to say, persuasive communications that serve to advocate may not, and I repeat, may not, have ethics in its process or as its outcomes. And I dare say that today, more than ever, asymmetrical warfare is the rule and not the exception. That makes our need to raise the discussion level on ethics to a much higher level. Even in the four-model approach, the Grunings have not let us go without ethical guidance. When utilitarian ethics are not in play, nor consequential ethics, we have as our guide deontological ethics. Deontological ethics, what are they? They, they boil down to having an obligation for dialogue coupled with an obligation to take that dialogue into consideration even as we advocate for a position. And I think Dr. Grunig's quote uh, from a recent video interview sums that up. And this is a very useful concept in this age of asymmetrical communications. So thank, thank you, Drs. Grunig. Now let me tell you why ethics is so important to me and Fleischmann Hillard. This is our relatively new logo, new mark, and new tagline the power of true. The concept of true plays to our heritage as a company that keeps its promises and values a culture built on respect for the individual. But true is also a forward-looking concept. Our clients need a trusted advisor, someone they can count on to help them through the myriad choices they face in today's confusing communications ecosystem. And as you probably have largely concluded, ethical, foundation, ethical behavior is foundational to building trust. Here's just a few of the qualities related to building trust. Honesty, fairness, loyalty, credibility, wisdom, selflessness, being ethical. These seem like universally valued character traits. But is the concept of ethical behavior a concrete notion subject to interpretation? Uh, or, or a notion subject to interpretation. Maybe it's just dependent on the situation, or maybe as the godfather once sa famously said, it's business, it's not personal. But godfather, does that make it okay? <laughs> I don't know. 
I guess one reason I'm here is because of the work we have done at Fleischmann Hillard and the Council of Public Relations Firms to rejuvenate the industry's commitment to ethical behavior. That resulted in the development and launch of the initiative Frank described called Ethics as Culture. That's a pretty interesting title, and I'll explain more about why we ended up with that title later. So what prompted this activity? What triggered this? For me, two events provided tremendous motivation. First, there was a classic ethical breach in the US PR industry in, the mid, uh, in mid 2011. Second, there was a milestone speech at a global conference exactly a year ago tonight that provided challenging views about what is acceptable ethical behavior. So first let me tell you the story about boys behaving badly and that um, smearing is a dish best served cold and anonymously. Uh, there were two technology companies, rival technology companies, battling for the same space. Technology company A began a smear campaign against technology company B and did so anonymously and used an agency to do the campaign. Now it's unclear whether the agency gave the technology company A the idea or technology company A gave the agency the idea. It really doesn't matter. Because first of all, you don't smear your competition. And secondly, you do not communicate anonymously without identifying who you're working on behalf of. And I have to say, I was really shocked and more than a little ashamed at the response of the industry. The industry response was basically a non-response. We all ducked our head and said that well-worn phrase, there but for the grace of God go I. And I want to tell you I reject that phrase. That is way too fatalistic, as if we have no control over our actions. But you know, the most disturbing point of this is that the, the people on the agency side who perpetrated this smear and who were ultimately discovered were recent uh, uh, immigrants into public relations. They were two very senior people from the media, news media industry. They had only been in public relations uh, a few months. Think of that. Senior personnel from the news industry come into the public relations industry, and this is what's disturbing, is that they came in, yeah, oh. <laughs> and this is what, I got a good sound effect here. This is what's disturbing. They came into the industry with the predisposition that public relations was all about dirty tricks, that it was okay to smear your competition and do so anonymously. I know PR has a profound history. Public relations plays a noble role in society. Public relations has principles. And if this proves anything, it proves you cannot get into public relations simply by changing your address. You've got to put in the time to learn about the role of public relations and what properly drives it. The second motivator I'm calling the Lord's speech. Not this Lord, but Lord Chadlington. A year ago tonight, uh, Paul Holmes, a prominent industry observer, held his first global summit in Miami, Florida. At that global summit was the inaugural grayling speech on ethics. That speech was delivered by Peter Gummer, also known as the Lord Chadlington. He was made a Lord, by the way, in 1996 in the UK. He was born uh, in 1942 as Peter Gummer. He founded Shandwick Public Relations in 1974, which later became Weber Shandwick. 
Today he is the CEO and director of Huntsworth PLC, which runs Grayling, Red Communications, Citygate, and Huntsworth Health, among other firms, and has recently uh, partnered with uh, the China-based Blue Focus. I think they took a $30 million stake in, in Huntsworth. But what's not listed on this little profile is that Lord Chadlington initially studied to be a priest, focusing on the study of morality. So he's a formidable voice in the industry in this regard, and I dare say, highly respected. Now, I'm going to run for you two rather lengthy excerpts from the speech. And I don't want to be accused of taking the Lord out of context. So I'd rather run a bit long so you can draw your own conclusions. So here we go. Okay, what did you hear him say? Don't wait for a microphone. What? Shout out. No one size fits all type of morality. Very good. Anyone else? Right. Very tied to the earlier comment. One more. Anyone? Yes. That's a good one. People show their character under pressure. I just jotted down a few of what I thought some of the major takeaways were. Uh, it is impossible to set a global standard for ethical behavior because our morality is innate and instinctually guides us. Rules on ethical behaviors are useless. Principles of ethical behaviors are useless. Ethical behavior is de defined by local customs and public relations should observe local customs even if they are unethical by some other standard as long as the agency culture can tolerate it. Now in fairness to Lord Chadlington, I've heard this before too many times in my view and from very highly placed public relations officials including a former White House press secretary. I know that's a shock, isn't it? Now, I have to say, I agree on some of his points, as you'll see. But I disagree with his lordship on two key points. That rules and principles are useless, particularly principles. And that we should surrender our idea of ethic, ethics to local customs. I mean, just one point. He laughs at the notion of public interest, yet implies that paying off a government official may actually qualify as something in the public interest. I am amazed at that. The act is not, in fact, in the interests of the public, but in the selfish interests of one greedy and immoral individual. So we have some clear disagreements here. Now let's explore a really central question. Is it possible that the concept of right and wrong differ that much by culture? Is it possible? Actually, the definition of good and evil, right and wrong, are pretty consistent across the world. I asked one of my researchers to see how many religions have a version of the Ten Commandments. Here's the partial list, and all of them say, do not be dishonest, and all of them say, do not steal. And organized religions, by the way, cover about 90% of the world population. The point is that notions of right and wrong are indeed universally held beliefs. This means we are not dependent on instinct alone. We have, in fact, a civil code of conduct that has been formed over the centuries. And if virtuous behavior was instinctive to mankind, we would not need such conventions. And there is a key point there. It is true we cannot possibly create enough rules to cover the infinite variety of choices we encounter, but we can create 
a set of principles that reasonable people can apply. Anything less has us playing at the lowest common denominator of behavior and judgment. And we need the guidance. We need to actively, we need to willfully, and we need to forcefully apply these principles or we will surely, slowly, and inevitably erode our own moral base. And it's a real present, I'm sorry, it's a real and present danger. Let me give you a favorite quote on the state of ethics in our world today. We have grasped the mystery of the atom and rejected the Sermon on the Mount. The world has achieved brilliance without conscience. Ours is a world of nuclear giants and ethical infants. Would it surprise you to know that this quote was from 1948? Delivered during an Armistice Day speech by our last five-star general, Omar Bradley? I think it demonstrates how ethical behavior has been an issue for the ages. I should add in the spirit of transparency that I do love this quote, but it is with the greatest sense of irony I tell you that Lord Chadlington used it in his speech too. <laughs> so what has happened? Are we in a godfather world where we can conveniently compartmentalize behaviors because they are customary or expected? Or because business has become off limits to morality and ethical decision making. So what's gone wrong? Why has corruption become so prevalent? It's clear that when you have a concentration of power in any one place and a lack of transparency, you have a breeding ground for corruption. But I ask you, is that any reason to give up? Of course not. Worldwide, all of this is changing. Democratic principles, i.e. principles of fairness, are being embraced and transparency is the driving force. Now some of this, mind you, is out of enlightened, an enlightened sense of self-preservation, but make no mistake, it is happening nonetheless. So this is where Mr. Chadlington and others like him have miscalculated how surprised they must be when the world changes Morality may not move you, and if it doesn't move you, how about practicality? How about a sense of survival? How do you feel about massive fines or jail time? Or how do you feel about being barred from business altogether? As a case in point, let's turn our attention to China. Historically a hotbed of corruption where, as Lord Chadlington has observed, Many companies have for years played by the local rules. Now here is a list of multinational companies who are now being singled out in China for years and years of allegedly corrupt behavior. Now this list could be a mile long. We have a technology company with 86 legal and ethical breaches in its China factories. A pharmaceutical company investigated for bribing government and medical officials. A banking company for hiring children of powerful officials, a form of bribery. And an engineering and construction company uh, being investigated for bribery in China and a half dozen other countries. Now again, this list could be much longer and some of this behavior has been documented to go back to the year 2001. Remember 2001? Back then, all of this was supposed to be acceptable behavior. And China is not alone in these investigations. These companies are also being investigated by their home country. And in the United States, they're being investigated according to the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. And in the UK, the uh, Anti-Bribery Act. And now in China, the Anti-Unfair Competition Law, and you'll note that China added a little more muscle to its own version of the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, something they called the guidance. And this timing is not coincidental. And of course, it's not just China coming on strong today. Here are eight companies accused of violating the US 
Foreign Corrupt Practices Act and the fines they ultimately paid. Let's just read some of these fines. $23 million for bribery of Iraqi officials, $70 million for bribery and kickbacks in several European countries, $1.6 million for bribery of Argentinian custom officials, $45 million for bribery of officials in Russia, Kazakhstan, China, and several European countries, $579 million for bribery over 10 years of Nigerian officials, $2 million for siphoning revenue for illicit purposes, $800 million, I guess that's the biggest number up there, for bribery in Mexico, Venezuela, Argentina, and Bangladesh, and $29 million for improper payments to officials in Russia, Brazil, China, and Poland. And why? Why do they do this? All of these companies are based in the U.S. and subject to the FCPA, yet they knowingly and willfully broke the law. Why? Why? Because it was the local custom. The U.S. law had not changed. It wasn't new and it wasn't strange or a surprise, but they took the risk anyway. Clearly, something is going on wrong inside these companies. Now, turning back to China, you have to ask, what has changed? Who knows who this man is? Bill, who is this man? Xi Jinping. Xi Jinping. General Secretary of the Communist Party of China, Chairman of the Central Military Commission, and President of the People's Republic of China. A few facts on him. He, Xi Jinping has quite a pedigree. He is considered a neo-Maoist, and no wonder. He is the son of Xi Zhongzhong, who was part of the original cultural revolution of Mao. And like many on the far left, he believes China has become too lenient and risks losing its distinctively Chinese and communist identity. But why the crackdown now? As mentioned, it's a reaffirmation of the underpinnings of communism. Second, there is more than a small dose of nationalism at play here as well. Many Chinese feel that foreign-based multinationals do too much taking and not enough contributing to the social and economic largesse of China. Third, China loses a lot of tax revenues due to corruption. Fourth, many view this period as a warning shot across the bows of all Chinese companies and a chance for those companies to get their act together. Indeed, the hammer is already coming down on numerous China-based companies. Fifth, China sees corruption as a big drag to its investment economy. And finally, if you ever really want to understand China, First, understand that every action and every external message is intended first for an internal audience. The ruling party of China has one overriding job, and that is to maintain peace and stability, and this is no small feat in a country as diverse as China. The current government has come to realize that, and, and if you're going to tweet something, tweet this. Corruption is not a sustainable model, and that it leads to distrust, anger, and unrest. It undermines the rule of law, so why obey any law? Moreover, many of the corners cut by corruption end up hurting the public. Food products that poison you, harm you, or kill you. Hard goods that are unreliable, they break down. Business opportunities that favor only those who can pay. Medicines that don't work and streets that don't get paved. The crackdown, by the way, has swept up many Chinese officials as well. They are being made public examples in very humiliating ways. China-based companies and state-owned enterprises are scrambling now to clean up their operations just as expected, just as designed. 
So what is the point? The point is that being in public relations is not a spectator sport. We in our industry believe in the nobility of service, but it's time we stood for something more. It's time for public relations to lead. In the case of each company mentioned earlier, and scores of others that we don't have time to talk about, what is the cost now of surrendering to unethical behaviors years ago when it seemed like an acceptable thing to do? How many fines will be paid? How many years will once free and innocent people spend in jail? Of course, we know the same thing now that we ignored back then, that this behavior was wrong. But there is simply no way to justify it, and any company with an ounce of decency will have seen it and skip the chance to enter the market, and there are many who have, or do so in a way that made it clear they were following different rules, and there were many of those as well. And today, even if a company is lacking a bit of decency, I hope they are not lacking a great deal of fear. But let's get back to a fundamental rule today. It's almost as irrefutable as a law of nature. No company can exist without the permission of its publics. If you lose the permission of your publics, you will lose your privilege to operate. And all of this is linked to the actual behaviors of your company. The ethical and, yes, even moral tone of any company is expressed in the day-to-day -day behaviors of its employees. And by the way, corporate leaders who think just a mission statement can tend to this part of the agenda, they might check out the headlines lately. The fact is most employees in the work environment have no greater personal connection to their own mission statements than they do the Magna Carta. Employees tend to work with the volume turned off to focus almost exclusively on their tasks. Likewise, staff units in corporate America define their value by the dimensions of their tasks. Marketers market. Operators search for efficiencies. Sales personnel sell. Corporate counsels litigate. Scientists innovate. HR staffs hire, fire and avoid lawsuits. But no longer can all the moving parts operate independently. In years past, when events were viewed separately, when communications didn't blend a company's actions into an immediately accessible record, life was better. Incidents were isolated, or at least companies worked very hard to style them as such. They were generally successful as each set of enforcers, each regulatory or legislative channel, and each special interest group tended to operate in silos as well. So they got away with this. So corporate organizations tended to reflect the outside world. Today, the sheer transparency of action, the wholesale availability of information on any topic at any time, makes the corporate organization of old obsolete. No action occurs in isolation, but in far too many companies, the old days are still around. So how do these companies threaten their own privilege to operate when sales personnel step into the gray area too many times? When companies stonewall opponents and in doing so energize them to act? By fighting regulators to the point of alienation, by making pricing or distribution decisions that hurt a special class of individuals. When production supervisors find efficiencies where others might find violations. When financial accounting becomes overly aggressive, blurring the true picture of the financial state of a company. By believing that logic and science will overcome human emotion and concern and by demonizing adversaries instead of listening and reacting constructively. The need for change has never been more urgent or more obvious. More companies today are being forced into accountability 
across a wider range of audiences. This is most evident in an industry with great public oversight in the form of regulation uh, and non-governmental organizations, uh, watchdog groups and the like, uh, industries like telecommunications, healthcare, finance, transportation, energy and education all come to mind. This brings us to the seminal question. Whose job is it to protect a company's permission to operate? Let me save you some time. It's our job. If it's not our job, then whose job is it? We are the moral conscience of our organizations. It's our obligation and duty to speak up. So how do we go about this? One answer is to look at the past. Many companies are quite comfortable with a brand management culture. Your marketing professors will tell you all about that. Here are the top 15 brands in the world according to uh, Interbrand's annual study of brand valuation. And what does a brand management culture mean? It means every decision that is made is filtered through the brand promise. What is the promise of the brand? And if the decision is inconsistent with the brand promise, the decision is killed. I think it's time for companies to establish similar mechanisms for something we can call character management. Not brand management, character management. This is a great quote from Abraham Lincoln. Character is like a tree and reputation like a shadow. The shadow is what we think of it. The tree is the real thing. So one suggestion is to create a cross-disciplinary steering group within each organization to provide a living, breathing, guiding hand and filter for decisions. Character management will become a business strategy. And this addresses a very simple truth which we touched on earlier. Unethical behaviors do not build a sustainable business model. Unethical behaviors create enemies. They risk the ire of lawmakers and regulators and they disenfranchise the public. In short, unethical behaviors may work in the near term, but they are not sustainable over the long term as we demonstrated earlier in these remarks. If we get character management right, we will save organizational jobs, we will save money, we will protect and drive value, we will open and preserve markets, and otherwise protect our organization's permission to operate. But what if you are not able to mobilize a character management group? What if you are all alone? You can still make a difference. The question public relations people should ask themselves every day is, Am I protecting my company's permission to operate? Do I feel what I and my company are doing is ethically correct? If the answers to these questions is anything short of yes, then you need to engage. You need to engage. Only by engaging management will you either change the organization or satisfy yourself that your company is making good choices perhaps based on information you may not know until you engage. Look, let's face it. Often we are deciding between two bad choices. Sometimes we are making decisions between two good choices. And we know that there are miles and miles of moral ambiguity in every day of corporate existence. Miles and miles, acres and acres of ambiguity inside the company every day. Now, of course, public relations people cannot be in every decision. But public relations people can do something that Lord Chadlington and I agree upon. Yay! Do everything you can to create a culture of ethical decision making. That means when there isn't a directive to refer to, their correct behaviors are almost atmospheric. Everyone knows what the organization stands for. The cues are there, the principles are known. The reinforcement and disincentives are unspoken, but well understood. 
We at Fleischmann Hillard and the Council of Public Relations Firms are trying to do the same thing for our industry. We are trying to put tools and methods in the hands of our agency and the council membership to enable both to create a living, breathing culture of ethical decision making. That, of course, is where ethics as culture comes in. Let me take you through a quick timeline of our efforts. In July of 2011, this was right after that first ethical breach I told you about, which just lit my hair on fire. Uh, we had internal discussions on conducting an ethical culture assessment. In November of 2011, we partnered with the Josephson Institute, a third-party ethics consultant, to assess our ethics tools, programs, training, and work environment. In January of 2012, we received the assessment from the Josephson Institute that included 23 recommendations uh, that we were to address to reach the excellent level uh, in their eyes. And each of those 23 sections had about 10 subsections. And it was a lot of work to uh, come up to standards. More than a year later, in February of this year, we presented our steps and actions to the board of directors of the Josephson Institute. And in May of this year, we did a soft launch of Ethics as Culture to a group of council members at the Council of Public Relations Firms Entrepreneur Forum in Chicago. In July of 2013, uh, we announced Ethics as Culture uh, to the Council of Public Relations Firms broadly, and the Ethics as Culture resource guide and associated training materials uh, were distributed and made available through the website. And as of uh, the end of July, we actually received the very first certification on ethics uh, from the Josephson Institute, which is subject to review every two years. Now, I want to make this clear, that ethics as culture goes way beyond training, way beyond training. It examines every aspect of how we behave or how we do things around here. All of our policies and procedures tend to drive one behavior or another, some intended, some unintended. So everything goes under the microscope. Now on behalf of Fleischmann Hillary and the Council of Public Relations Firms, we've provided enough copies of the executive summary uh, that should be on your chair. And there is much more to this program than, than you will find in here. You have to go online. There's a card in the back that allows you to quickly scan and go to the website. Um, it's very deep, it's very involved, it's uh, taking uh, really two years to create and I, I really uh, invite you to dive into it and maybe have a few brown bag luncheons to talk about it. Um, and I hope you have the time to sa sample each area of information, each area of guidance and each area of training now, before I take questions, I want to leave you with yet another quote that I have used many times. It's from the great philosopher Aristotle, and it contains inherently good advice. He said, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence, therefore, is not an act, but a habit. As public relations practitioners, we can help our organizations Form a habit of excellence in the area of ethical decision making. This takes courage. This takes conviction. Tonight, I hope I provided just a small amount of both. Thank you very much. Do we have time for questions? You bought it? <laughs> no arguments? No confusion? All right.
for your organization. Can you maybe describe one of those recommendations and how you went about changing that to make it open? This is not rehearsed, right? I just happen to have all 23 recommendations here. <laughs> Um, I'll read just a few. That's a great question. Fleischmann Hiller's commitment to high ethical standards and his unique culture should be more visibly, powerfully, and pervasively integrated into all major communications, including its website, client, and employee recruiting materials and training. So evidently, we were really not putting our ethical commitment forward or visibly enough. Here's a recommendation eight. The Fleischmann-Hillard operating policies and procedures should be amended and educational opportunities provided regarding standards of conduct and guidelines in specialized areas of practice. See, we're thinking like public relations is this big amorphous thing. And they saw that, no, we're a, a collection of specialties and special industries. And each of those should have its own uh, area of, of concentration. Recommendation 10, Fleischmann Hillard should carefully examine claims made by employees in non-US offices regarding the uh, propriety and efficacy of certain policies and procedures and determine whether localized modification of the policy is justified and proper. That's a mouthful, but it means so much to us when we operate in 85 offices in 28 countries. It is not a one-size-fits-all world. But there are principles that will drive us. We, as a company, have shared values. Uh, and that's very important to uphold those values. Because there are, there are things we're just not going to do. We've quit clients. We've not bid for clients. Um, we've fired people. Uh, because we do have a culture that is centered around a certain set of values. Uh, and finally, recommendation 20, I know you don't want me to read all 23, but um, Fleischmann Hillard should designate a high level employee reporting directly to the president, an independent ethics officer with operational responsibility for the ethics program, blah, 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 an ethics officer. I have to tell you, we debated this. We really debated this. Because, I mean, it's like having a creative officer. You mean we're not all creative? Or, uh, you know, if you have an ethics officer, is that the only person who's ethical? So we really debated this, and we have installed this person, but it was someone who historically, we haven't announced it yet, so the Fleischmann Hiller people here are getting the, the news. Um, this person has historically been the moral conscience of the firm. This will not be that great a leap. It will provide a third party, but not just as a reporting channel, but as someone who visibly can also uh, drive ethical discussions across our uh, company, as much a facilitator of discussion as a, uh, a police chief of ethics or uh, a sheriff. I uh, hope that's helpful. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. And uh, I, I wanted to ask because the, I, I think it's what you've done in question, Hillary, is, is uh, takes a lot of courage. You know, stand up in the, in the, in, the uh, in, in our community and say, and take this stance, I think it's really powerful. But I want to ask two parts to my question. One, most public relations offices within organizations aren't a, a full organization. So to take a, a principal position on ethics as we, we want, but make it a platform in determining or giving our organization permission to operate um, is, is, is difficult at best um, to do in such a small, a small percentage of the organization. So what input would you provide to uh, to actually establishing that type of um, um, culture in an organization with such a small group? First, and then second, you mentioned that ethics is not just training. Um, what would you say as if, if you've done or, or that you recommend in such an environment to 
get that to permeate beyond uh, the organization, just uh, training? Yeah, uh, great questions. I'll take the second first. Um, I mentioned in my remarks that virtually every practice and policy that you have in your company uh, encourages one form of behavior or another. And sometimes that behavior is uh, unintended and unethical. Let's just take an example, and not to pick on any one profession, but let's say you have a highly sales-driven organization. And everyone is compensated around the notion of increasing their sales by 15% a year. Do you know what people will do to hit that number? Now, every sales organization probably has a range of people, honorable people, just like the people in this room. But people start to erode their kind of moral base by one thing and then another thing and then another thing. And pretty soon, they find that sales reports are falsified, there are kickbacks, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's really what I'm, it's, you, you, it's not about just a training uh, exercise. It's letting people know what the company stands for, what it enforces, and what is right or what is wrong. That's really what I mean by ethics as culture. There, this uh, program looked at our billing practices, uh, how we record our time, uh, our philosophy points, um, how, you know, just our, how we communicate on ethics, uh, how we deal with the news media, social media, what were our policies. And by the way, we subscribe to the ethics and principles of the word of mouth marketing association tends to drive a lot of our social media decision making. Um, so it is, it's really, uh, the, the folks at the Josephson Institute, Michael Josephson, a lawyer who retired from practicing law, is a real zealot. He sees ethical components underneath every decision, underneath every construct in an organization. So it was exhaustive. Uh, I'm getting tired just thinking about it. But on the first question, um, I would refer you to some of the organizations like Public Relations Society of America. Arthur Page does a great job of this. IPRA, IPR, a bunch, ECO. There's a body of knowledge that shows that ethical business decision making uh, that which you know the, the shadow of that company is is valuable, and companies who have let that shadow erode are less valuable. They're less able to attract great employees. They're less able to sell their product. They're less able to get out of a crisis. They're less able to fend off regulation. There are real costs associated with the corrosion that unethical behavior will bring to your organization. So establish your proof points. And there's probably a lot of studies by industry. And if I recall correctly, you handle ethical student uh, and, and community issues here at the university. Did I get that right? OK. Oh. No, this gentleman. Yeah, because I couldn't see in the, in the back here. But in, in your case, then, it would be how do universities handle crisis? Or how do they promote ethical business decision making? Um, there are special cases for this. That's number one. So establish your fact base. Number two, um, you have to have a good relationship with management. You, you can't just be the shrill voice, but you have to be able to show problem solution, problem solution. Where do you want to go with this? And uh, I remember a, a PR guy, uh, he was the uh, chairman of the seminar and a prominent member of Arthur Page from Monsanto. And in he held all these great positions in like 1968. 
And by the time I heard him lecture in 1985, somebody asked him, how do you define public relations? And he said, public relations is an attitude of management. And that's really stuck with me over the years. And I've heard hundreds of definitions. So if your management does not believe that engaging with stakeholders to harmonize the objectives of an organization and society, then you, you probably, you know, beating your head against the wall. And uh, as somebody said at a table today, uh, if your values are not aligned with the organization and, and, and there's this disconnect, uh, and you don't feel like you can change the organization after many efforts trying, then you might want to move on. Vote with your feet. But don't give up, you know, initially. I hope that's helpful. One, one okay, one more. Thank you very much for this excellent presentation. As someone who taught global public relations, I want to talk about the universal universal aspect of uh, the ethical part about public relations. Uh, what would be your best advice or tips for somebody who's doing public relations internationally or globally to walk the thin line safely? Yeah. Well, that's, that's really what I'm trying to get at here. You've come right to the heart of it. Um, that if we think our job is to follow, then our souls will be lost. All the public relations people associated with those companies that are in jail or paying enormous fines, those public relations people, they know they could have made a difference. And maybe we're not talking about massive change, but incremental change. How can I get, it's like climbing the mountain. You don't do it in one big leap. You do it in small steps. But it's like the, I said to the gentleman a moment ago. Rules change. Local customs change. Morality really doesn't change. And in the end, morality is going to win. And if you can convince management of that, if you can convince the editor of the newspaper that uh, paying off his reporters is uh, a corrosion of his own franchise, and let's find another way um, than one step at a time. Um, I know that uh, I'm not that naive to know that you can just shut things down. You, you have you have to help the client navigate difficult situations. But my, my advice is, again, to think about the enduring values that um, you believe in, that, as we demonstrated, 90% of the world really believes in, and appeal to that and find a path. Maybe that, in small steps, helps you, you get there. And in time, uh, then things um, will will improve. I've seen this happen uh, in many markets, uh, Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, I've seen this in India. Uh, I have seen this in, um, uh, in Vietnam, um, in um, uh, Nigeria. It's a lot of, I mean, there's still a lot of tension here about, you know, selfishness and greed versus doing the right thing. But if you're a company that has really good news that's important to the world, don't sell that short. You know, you've got something of value. So if, if reporter A doesn't want to cover you because you wouldn't pay him money, then let's go direct. This is what social media is all about. Let's use alternative sources. You probably got far more leverage than you really thought of. And I would... Uh, advised to be very resourceful um, in that regard. But don't, don't surrender. Mm -hmm.